Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is our series called Transitional Justice. And today we're going to talk about transitional justice in South Sudan uh, with a member of the Project Expedite Justice Organization, who just happens to be in Phnom Penh. That's where he's from. His name is Atatep Mies. Uh, thank you, Atatep. Thank you, Tep, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So I want to talk about Sudan, you know, because I think that, you know, the way the media works is, you know, you you hear about, um, you know, the flashpoints, you hear about the raw meat stories. A few weeks later, there's some other raw meat story, and they don't report about Sudan anymore. And, but I want to be clear, Sudan's still happening. Uh, South Sudan is still um, in violence, and there's two generals battling each other and killing people who are in the crossfire. And Project mm -hmm. Expedite Justice is still on it. Um, from its its uh, its people all over the world, including you. So um, tell us what you know about, you know, how this is evolving in South Sudan right now. So in order to understand uh, the current conflict, you would have to go back when to uh, Sudan itself became independent. Uh, that was in 1956, and ever since Sudan was just engulfed in a series of civil wars. I believe there were two that ranged from 1962 to uh, 2005. Uh, and in 2005, that's when peace talks started to take place. There was this drafting and almost um, the adoption of a comprehensive peace agreement called the CPA, which would uh, be a resolution for the Northern government and the rebellious South uh, to agree on peace, essentially. And um, it was until 2009 that uh, talks of South Sudan's autonomy and independence began. And in 2011, that's when South Sudan actually became independent. But mm -hmm. not for long. Um, you know, it was soon enough. Uh, we we had um, uh, a lot of violence. Can you talk about the more recent experience with violence in Sudan? Oh, there were multiple instances of um, violent er eruption of violence within South Sudan, even after the country gaining independence. Fun fact, it is still, it still maintains the title of being the youngest country in the world, uh, having gained independence in 2011. But in 2013 to 2015 to 2018, and as of recent in 2020, there were a series of violence where allegations by the international community surfaced that South Sudan, uh, the various factions fighting within the country are committing uh, grave and atrocity crimes, such as war crimes, crimes against humanity, or potentially genocide. It's hard to wrap your mind around the fact that this these war crimes and atrocities and violations of human rights and the like are between people who are in the same country. They're all Sudanese. And the two generals that are battling it out now, they're Sudanese. And the people who are wounded and killed and um, the victims of war crimes in, in the crosshairs are being killed by their two Sudanese armies. This is, you know, hard for American people to understand because we haven't had that, not not on the same level, and and therefore, you know, you have to sort of change the culture, don't you? You have to uh, find who is responsible for this and and show the Sudanese people, whatever institutions there are, um, and the world uh, that this is not acceptable. And mm. one of the ways you do that is you investigate and find out who has done what. So tell me about the you know the state of investigation, if you would, as to all the war crimes that have happened in, in Sudan, South Sudan, over the past few years. Who's investigating? Uh, who is encouraging them, organizing them to investigate? Um, what kind of what is investigation along these lines, and uh, where does that lead? There, it's not. Uh, so the current situation is in South Sudan. It is not short of interested uh, players who are conducting. Uh, these investigations onto these serious human rights violations and also atrocity crimes, PEJ being included. Um, uh, I won't speak so much about the international players, but rather I will just focus on uh, what PEJ is doing within South Sudan. 
we are, uh, well, we no longer help. It was a previous project, uh, but as we were uh, operating, we were helping local CSOs and NGOs uh, with in capacity building, uh, mentoring and training local investigators uh, where they would go onto these conflict affected areas within South Sudan. Nine regions were our focus at the time. What these investigators will do is that they document these atrocity crimes from witnesses and victims. They bring them back to us and we sort of sanitize these reports for uh, accountability purposes, whether it's in the form of publishing it as an investigative report or maybe submitting that to a uh, a judicial body, whether it's a domestic or an international court, such as the ICC. Yeah, the ICC, we, we've been covering that a little bit and uh, finding out that the primary method of referral of, of uh, war crimes to the uh, for the prosecution of the ICC is done by the United Nations, even though the, mm -hmm. the two are distinct organizations. The United Nations is, is where the um, the charge comes from, so to speak. But the United Nations is locked up because in the Security Council, we have two wayward members at least, and uh, one of them is uh, Russia, one of them is China, and they they don't particularly want to go after war crimes because they are conducting war crimes themselves, and it's understandable. Um, so the problem is that the United Nations doesn't refer a whole lot of cases to the ICC. Um, there are other arrangements, other possibilities for referring cases. Um, by the prosecutors themselves and others in the community. But it, it uh, strikes me that uh, there are so many places in the world where war crimes are being investigated, but the ICC hasn't had any trials. It hasn't, mm -hmm. had, it hasn't had any live, uh, you know, uh, live prosecutions. It, the only places you can think of lately is uh, Germany, um, where they, they uh, prosecuted a Syrian general a, a year or two ago, and that, and that was uh, somewhat encouraging. And then France, where the um, Supreme Court of France uh, well, has been, you know, behind a legal wall, and uh, it, the up till uh, just a, this year, the Supreme Court of France really didn't allow for a lot of war crimes prosecution under the notion mm -hmm. of universal jurisdiction. But they changed it, and we'll see what happens. I think mm -hmm. France has a way to go to get to where Germany is, um, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, you can go into the country itself. You can go into. South Sudan, to the extent there are institutional, you know, institution, institutions that can actually prosecute and conduct trials, um, mm -hmm. but there's not a whole lot of options. So uh, I, I, I pose to you this possibility of lots of investigation, lots of reports, but no prosecution. Uh, what are mm -hmm. your thoughts about that? So um, it really depends on. So international experts have. Uh, Posit the notion of the possibility that the case of South Sudan may uh, appear within the ICC's jurisdiction for two reasons. First, by way of Article um, 12, Item 3 of the Rome Statute, which the ICC may incur its jurisdiction onto uh, South Sudanese perpetrators which may possess a dual citizenship especially with a country that is a state party to uh, the Rome Statute. As of current, South Sudan... Talking about is, universal jurisdiction in, in Europe, right? Um, it could... It, no, it's more about uh, the principle of complementarity under the Rome Statute. So uh, the ICC can prosecute those who have possessed dual citizenship uh, if the other citizenship is of a country that is a party to the Rome Statute. So this is similar to the, uh, it, it's an analogy, it's not a direct <laughs> example, but really uh, I think to bring the, the, the closest example that I can think of is the case of Myanmar and the Rohingya Muslims, where uh, even though the ICC does not have jurisdiction to look into the situation of Myanmar, they have conducted investigations um, onto the Muslim victims that have crossed the Myanmar uh, border into Bangladesh, Bangladesh being a party to the Rome Statute. So a similar situation may happen, uh, but it is very slow. Second is an even slower solution, um, 
not sure whether it's even a possibility, but it, it is to await the election of a new leader um, that would possibly ratify and consent to the ICC's jurisdiction um, and possibly could also agree for the ICC to look retroactively into crimes that took place even before um, 2013. So those mm -hmm. are the two possibilities, but there are a lot of geopolitical issues uh, with the ICC and also African leaders, especially with the recent backlash of them thinking that the ICC is very biased towards African nations. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the problem is that um, you know the world is watching. Uh, there's enough uh, media out there to make the world aware, I think, but uh, the world also is likely to react. Well, that's nice, but uh, gee whiz, how about some prosecutions? It's like in, in the case of Ukraine, you know, you see it on television. You see the witnesses, like in 60 Minutes, uh, a couple of days ago. You see, I see the witnesses uh, essentially telling their stories. Uh, about the the atrocities against them, um, that it's only media, and mm -hmm. it doesn't result in prosecutions or convictions or or sentences. And you know the average person says, "Well, this this system isn't working very well because it's only a story; it's not mm -hmm. a result." And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, my my feeling about um, war crimes is we have to develop a a better system. Uh, but mm -hmm. let's talk about the investigation of the capacity building. I guess the first thing we need to do, um, and this is, goes back to Berkeley, doesn't it? The, the Berkeley Agreement, the Berkeley um, Agreement where you, you have standards for investigation. Mm -hmm. um, and so what are the standards in general and uh, who is investigating and what do you do to investigate? So uh, we sort of uh, structured our investigative process after the Berkeley Protocol 2. Um, one of the main uh, one of the main principles that we want to abide by is taking a human rights centered approach to the investigations, and that is to prevent the risk of uh, re-traumatization. Uh, I forgot to acknowledge too that PEJ's role with it, with its investigations onto the situation of South Sudan, we do place an emphasis on gender based violence, which uh, the risk of re-traumatization is much much higher. Um, you mean like against women? Against women, yes. Mm -hmm. And young girls too, because when you hear uh, these stories, it just angers you. Women who are placed in refugee camps uh, are, sometimes they would need to go out to nearby forests to fetch some water or firewood to bring back to the camps. And along their journey, you would constantly hear reports of them um, encountering uh, the different military factions, whether it's from the government or other rebels, and they are then raped. Uh, if lucky, they survive. If not, they are shot on the spot. So it it oh. it angers you. Yeah, it does. And it's not only women. Um, it, it there's no discrimination as to age of victimization, really because uh, you hear also stories, young girls as young as 10 years old who are also um, sexually assaulted, raped, and usually they pass away from the incident too because of succumbing to their injuries. But why do people, never mind, I mean, it is a question, why do people do such things? Why are they so mean, so pathological that they have mm. to kill women that way? That was the main question amongst um, external viewers too uh when they look into uh the situation of south sudan they just can't wrap their heads around as to why these incidents are happening right and um throughout my work it appears to be on an ethnic basis where even though south sudan is very ethnically diverse they're also very loyal to their ethnic groups so anyone who is outside of their group they would be they would not treat them so fairly so uh, pej is investigating uh, pej is um um you're in uh, phnom penh um and and we have uh, other other uh, pej 
uh, people we've talked to who are out, outside the country, and like, for example, in Kampala. Mm -hmm. And um, how can you investigate at long distance that way? Uh, how can you encourage the investigation or organize or train investigators remotely that way? Mm. I would want to be privy with uh, the namings of our partners too, but we do have, uh, um, we help these local investigators. We sort of get connected to them and uh, we sort of post calls on a biweekly or sometimes a monthly basis just to check up on them. Uh, they document these atrocities. They put it in a Google uh, doc form or a Word document. They send it to us. We sort of help review and uh, help provide comments, essentially, because some of the reports do not have all the elements that is needed to establish a crime, right? And sometimes um, they often confuse uh, with what is a domestic crime and what is an international crime, which can render some of these evidence inadmissible before an international forum. Um, and so we sort of help guide them to, to drafting these reports to be admissible and as clean as possible before being submitted for an international judicial body. Mm -hmm. mm, that's very interesting. So um, they, they use computers and they mm -hmm. type it out on uh, Google Docs or whatever program it is, and, and then they email it uh, to, um, you know, people like you. And mm -hmm. uh, the woman I mentioned, uh, her name is Cynthia Ibali in mm -hmm. Kampala. And, um, and you look at it and say, hmm, this, this may or may not be useful. So why don't you go back, am I right? Why don't you go back to this witness that you spoke with um, and ask some more questions and flesh out this report so it can be more useful for more jurisdictions? Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And I can't um, help but say this enough. Uh, their work is incredibly admirable because they are putting themselves uh, and their lives and their families' lives on the line by going into these conflict uh, affected areas to document these atrocities. Because the government can always find ways to trace back who uh, are helping these prospective victims. And, you know, that could present a lot of dangers to these uh, local investigators. And there were also an instance, I think, I believe back in late 2019 or early 2020, where uh, civil society organizations were, or had their offices raided uh, in linkage to a demonstration that took place in Juba, the capital of South Sudan. So there's a lot of danger. <laughs> Uh, in the face of um, these investigators, yet still they want to help their countrymen. They want to help find accountability for uh, uh, the victims and hold perpetrators to account. These documents you get, are they in English or some other language? They are in English, yes. Mm -hmm. But there is a process, I believe, a process of translations too, because not all victims or witnesses uh, speaks um, English, they speak in their native tongue, uh, the majority being Dinka or Nur, those are the ethnic dialects or languages within South Sudan, and most likely they are translated um, <clears throat> into English and then sent to us, and then we provide guidance and we send it back to them. <clears throat> you know, uh, Kep, um, mm -hmm. one picture is worth a thousand words, and that's really true and shown to be true in our time. Um, so query, do these uh, reports that um, the investigators make and, and send to you and others, do they, do they include graphics, pictures, um, maps, um, uh, footage of any kind, or is it just uh, written down? It, it, is, it is only a written statement, but the details are incredibly disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in one of the reports that I remember uh, back when I just freshly graduated from uni, um, I didn't, I did not have, so um, I've heard of criminal cases before, and it can be incredibly graphic, right? But I've seen it on TV, and uh, I never really saw it for myself until I started working for PEJ. I read, I started reading these reports, and when you read, you start to 
uh, making, you start to visualize it in your head, right? As to the events of what took place within this particular story. And um, there was this one victim who um, encountered five armed men from the military. He was accused of helping some of the rebels and they sort of took him to a nearby bush. Uh, they raped him with their guns. Uh, essentially, they uh, stick uh, the muzzle of their uh, guns onto the person's anus, and then they shot him from the inside out. Oh, it was incredibly, incredibly. Oh, that is disturbing, even to think about it. So yeah. you know, the investigators were at some risk. What's interesting is that you have two warring factions. Both of them are conducting. Am I right? Both of them are conducting war crimes and atrocities, right. both sides. And so um, it, it, it doesn't matter which side your report mm, writes up. It doesn't matter which side you're, you're investigating. Both mm -hmm. sides are going to be uh, looking to dismantle your operation and find you and, and punish you because you're investigating essentially the truth about mm -hmm. war crimes. So that makes it very dangerous for anybody who is out there in the field talking to witnesses. Am I right? Exactly. Uh, it started with two, uh, mainly the uh, Sudan's Liberation, Sudan's People Liberation Movement or ARMY, the SPLA or M. Usually uh, the names are very <laughs> convoluted when it's being reported by different uh, players wishing to investigate. Um, and the other is the Sudan's People Liberation Movement or Army in Opposition, the SPLAIO. The conflict started between the infighting of these two groups where the president uh, accused, uh, the president being Salva Kiir at the time, in 2013, he accused his vice president, Rick Machar, of conducting a coup d'etat, but it was a failed coup attempt. And then when the party lines sort of split, uh, the soldiers who remained um, loyal on an ethnic basis, sort of separated from uh, the main Sudanese government, which uh, gave rise to the term in opposition of the SPLAIO. Um, and then the fighting between these two groups uh, sort of spread across South Sudan, creating more and more defections, more splinter groups, more rebels, so on and so forth. And every group sort of uh, fight upon or fight for this idea of patriotism. They're fighting for their countrymen, but at the same time, they're always looting. They're always destroying. They're always killing their own people uh, under the accusation of, oh, you're supporting party A or party B. Why aren't you supporting me? Right? So um, that, <laughs> that is the uh, situation of South Sudan in a nutshell. Yeah, that's madness. So the other thing that comes to mind is um, that if I'm a witness, um, if, if the investigator has talked to me or wants to talk to me, and I'm a witness and I'm you know either writing it down or uh, talking to the investigator to report what I have seen, mm -hmm. what I know, I'm also at great risk um, because I'm 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 also um, uh, um, I'm also a target for both sides because in, in reporting the truth, I make myself the enemy of essentially of both sides. And mm -hmm. so, gee whiz, I, I I would want to stay secret. I would want to stay out of harm's way, just as the investigator wants to stay out of harm's way. So here we have the report. The report is, um, you know, written, and maybe it's, uh, you know, there's supplements to it, as you said, and mm -hmm. uh, ultimately it's going to be submitted to um, a, a court uh, or a, an international organization that mm -hmm. conceivably could make a prosecution out of it. But when that happens, the names of the individuals come out. So isn't it possible that those who conducted the war crimes at whatever level, at the at the you know trooper in the field level or the general level, um, they're going to find out the names of the people involved and and go after them. Isn't is that ever happening? 
<clears throat> so um, as part of the do no harm principle, we also try to maintain the safety and security of uh, those and um, the investigators interviews. And essentially there is a process of redaction where their names, personal uh, and other personal information are redacted, but they are withheld by the um, investigating organization. We're not the ones um, conducting the investigation, rather we help uh, the investigating organization, uh, we help guide them as to make good and sanitized investigative reports to be admissible before a court. Speaking of a court, I forgot to mention that um, there was this prospect of the establishment of a hybrid court within South Sudan. A lot of people have been longing for it. It is also part of the peace agreement. Um, when uh, all of this conflict sort of broke out, but there is this constant lack of political will and also um, you know, it's just perpetrators knowing that they will be prosecuted someday. Uh, that they do not want to have this be successfully executed because they're going to be facing jail time. <laughs> mm. Is there a death penalty in the law? Um, I cannot recall. I do not think so within uh, South Sudan's uh, constitution. Mm. So um, the other thing you mentioned is trying to achieve the, the trust of the people involved. Uh, to socialize it not only among the investigators, but among mm -hmm. the witnesses. How do you do that where, where, when there's such a risk for them to um, tell you what happened? Uh, how oh. do you make them trust your investigator and trust you know, all the organizations involved? That is also incredibly difficult because uh, there was an assessment done by the South Sudanese Law Society, and um, they surveyed what people think uh, what is the definition of transitional justice or justice in general within the context of South Sudan? Some people wanted the war to end, others wanted uh, accountability, but these groups do not, uh, there seems to be no consensus. They're so extreme on both points where the people who are not affected by the conflict just wants the conflict to end and the victims just wants accountability. So it is incredibly difficult and um, incredibly stagnated, but we can only hope that in due time, progress is made and um, justice is served. Well, you know, I would, uh, of course, I think it's valuable for people who are conducting war crimes to know that they are being investigated um, and that one day they may wind up in jail and, um, you know, lose, lose, their, lose their liberty, their freedom uh, and be punished. Um, mm -hmm. And and maybe that um, you know maybe that is a factor in in what they do and for how long they do it. But mm -hmm. you know, it strikes me that the, the threat of uh, accountability uh, may not be the solution to a a civil war. It may not be the solution to people who are out there uh, killing and and raping and you know doing atrocities every day. Um, so the question I put to you is what. What role does is, is that, that is the investigation and ultimately, hopefully, the prosecution of these atrocities, what role does that play in the larger, um, what do you want to call it, historical process, the process mm -hmm. by which, hopefully, someday, this will stop? Um, mm -hmm. what, what will it take to stop it? I, I can't say for certain because um, you, you have in the transitional uh, process, you're going to have different groups with different competing interests. Um, that was also one of the question for, uh, I believe, I forgot what the specific name was called. Um, it's a human rights, it's a UN Human Rights Commission that talked briefly about this. Um, and they also pointed out the issue of who to prioritize first. Uh, the two aforementioned groups, the people who wants accountability, the others, who wants just for the conflict to end, right? Um, but I believe uh, the first step to for South Sudan to take is to stop the fighting. Um, and it has been doing that, uh, to be fair to South Sudan, but there's still small scale fighting that is happening. It has decreased admittedly ever since um, 
2020, I believe. Uh, but still, the small scale violence also produces <clears throat> more numbers of victims. More uh, one is more than enough, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it is. In, it, it, I I can't answer that question directly, Jay. <laughs> no, I understand. It's it, and maybe it's unanswerable. You know what? What what do you do to, to stop the madness? Because it's you know rationality is not necessarily a solution here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I've suggested to other people who have appeared on our shows that maybe it's just a fatigue theory where as society, including, you know, the war criminals, just get tired of doing it. And they find out there's really no, no, no benefit in it. Um, and they just get tired and, and it stops. Uh, mm. After a time, nobody, you know, some people anyway, would not be interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the only thing I can think of as a factor that would um, that, you know that would um, determine the end of the process of the of the mm -hmm. criminal war process. So um, okay, so I, I just uh, I want to know uh, um, about your view of this and how you feel about it. You you've alluded to that, and uh, I'd like to ask you. A, uh, you know, you're you're Cambodian. Um, Cambodia has had its own problems. We've discussed that. Um, but um, how do you feel about what's going on? I mean, it's, it's also happening in Ukraine. And I suppose we could look at other places in the world where there are atrocities taking place um, on a regular basis. Uh, it, it must be a hard life for you to hear these stories. Um, you know, examine the, the the testimonies of the witnesses and so forth. Uh, it it must get on your nerves, doesn't it? Um, it does. It again, it feels incredibly sad that uh, one person is so small, and you cannot help um, in a conflict as big as a civil war. Um, but all that we can do right now as investigators is to document as much as we can, so that um when the judicial process or proceedings starts uh it goes smoothly and uh, there are no delays and after you, as you said uh, at the start of the show if justice is delayed justice is denied right <clears throat> yeah mm -hmm. we okay. we are doing the best that we can when it comes to uh the investigations and what so about that, your your commitment to to uh, to, to deal with this your commitment to to um, invest your time and your education, your interest uh, in dealing with these atrocities. Uh, what does it look like from here forward for you? Mm, I think diplomacy would be a big, big contributor uh, to stopping the conflict because if one knows how to uh, properly conduct a characteristic approach to uh, the parties involved, then most likely the conflict will end uh, will end much more sooner because, as you said, there's no point as to fighting, right? And sometimes waiting for the fighting to fatigue, it's very time consuming. <laughs> there's no uh, right or wrong approach, but I believe that um, if people can talk it out properly, people can sort of see on a bigger picture as to what is happening, how many people have died, and how much resources they are wasting as opposed to just developing the country, uh, maybe it'll bring them back to the road of development and prosperity yeah. for the country. Well, I hope you do that. I hope you commit your whole life to it. Um, I think I, I think it's a very valuable way to spend your time and and I uh, admire you for your commitment. Uh, Inatep Mies, uh, mm -hmm. joining us from uh, Phnom Penh, Cambodia, a part of Project Expedite Justice. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Jay. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, Please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube.
You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.